Uh, th- this morning, I want to I- I get into the message, and I want to talk to you about something that's just very, as you can see, the title is uh, Keeping Life Simple. Wouldn't that just be great if life was simple all the time? Uh, never a problem in the world, and, and if there is a problem, everything just goes just uh, hunky-dory and everything, you know. But it doesn't always happen that way, does it? But what is it that the Bible says about us? I want to talk to you about, and I'm going to give you three words, okay, uh, throughout this message that I want us to extract from the Word of God about keeping life simple, not jeopardizing or being wishy-washy or anything like that. What does the Bible have to say about keeping life just in its most simplest form? And so we'll take a look. There's an outline in your bulletin if you'd like to follow along with. Uh, if you're using version, we've got the outline there on, on there for you. Those of you that are joining us online, thank you for uh, inviting us into your homes. And I'm, I'm sure that every one of us knows what it's like to experience stress, difficulties, challenges, crisis. We, we understand that. But what, what is it that we really need to focus on in our journey with Christ? Because it's told in the Word of God, it's a guarantee, in this world you will have what? Tribulations, trials. But it says, but be of good joy or uh, cheer because I've overcome the world. Um, what is it that, that we need to know? And I want to talk about keeping it simple. Now, there was one season that this particular football team um, had a, a very famous coach. His name is Vince Lombardi. He's the coach of the Green Bay Packers. Y'all never thought you'd get a Green Bay Packer illustration out of this pastor, did you? But uh, Vince Lombardi, one of the, one of the greatest coaches, uh, when he was coaching his team, suffered one of the greatest losses, or at least to him was one of the most discouraging losses he had, and it was to an inferior team. It's a team they should have beat. It's a game that they should have won, and he was disappointed with the team's performance. He was disappointed with how things were handled, and so Coach Lombardi called for a special practice, and he wanted everybody there, and though they were disgruntled and they weren't very happy about it, the players showed up for this special meeting and for this special practice. And Coach Lombardi expressed his concerns, and he said, okay, it's time to get back to the basics. He held, this is what he did. He, this is a football right now, okay? And he went in front of all his, of his professional football players, and he said, this is a football. Now, he wasn't trying to insult their intelligence. They know what a football is, but could it have been that maybe they forgot what the focus was all about. It was not about uh, if their uniforms looked good. It wasn't about how many people were in the stands. It was about playing the game of football. And it got me thinking, just even in the comments that he made, uh, sometimes I think we need to stop and say, you know what, if we really want to keep life simple, this is the Word of God. Amen. We've all heard the, it is what I, it says I am, you know, but do you believe it? And we've got to get back to the basics of the Word of God. And in the Word of God, um, what I want to do today is is, is, is I want us to go on this journey. I want us to learn together about some foundations for success. And we're going to keep it very simple. But I I put up on on the screen, you'll see in a moment, Psalms chapter 11, verse 3. And here's what it says. Actually, let's read this one together. You ready? Go. If the foundations be destroyed... What can the righteous do? Foundations are very important, aren't they? You guys are in a building, and the building has been stable for years because of the foundations that were poured. You can build a building on a poor foundation, but the building isn't going to last very long. Why? Because the foundation's not very good. You can have a poor foundation, a mediocre foundation, a so-so-so foundation, but the first storm that comes along is going to blow it down. And so foundations are very important. Over the years, um, I've taken time and I've gotten into the Word of God. I've listened to people preach. I've preached messages myself. I've listened to sermons on podcasts. I've read books. I've done some studying. And, and all learning about ideas and principles throughout the Scriptures on, on how to solve life's challenges because life is going to be full of them. And I tried to discover foundational principles that if I followed them, they would make my life worthwhile. You know what I mean by that? 
I'm not talking about I was depressed and, you know, oh, life's, you know. I'm just talking about what is the main points that I need to focus on to keep life in its most simplistic form so that there's a foundation, so that I can experience some success. By the way, just a side note, how many of you know that being successful doesn't mean you never have failure, right? You will experience failures along the way. My question is, is will you learn from them or not? That's when you truly succeed. It's when you learn from the good as well as the bad. You learn from both of them. And so I looked at some of these principles, methods. Uh, I've I've said this before, but uh, methods can always change, but principles never do. Methods will change. You can have seven seven steps to a healthier kid. You can have five steps to a successful marriage. You can have 12 steps to a financial breakthrough. And I'm not making fun of any of those or, or, or dogging those. If you guys look at my outlines, every week, I'm like, here's three points to this. And here's, one. you know what I mean? There's nothing wrong with that. You can have methods, but methods without the principles being applied is futile. You've got to be able to take what it is that you hear from the Word of God and Allow it to transform your life, which means that you and I have some responsibility in this. It means that we have to do some work in the middle of all of this. So there's a lot of methods, but principles, the methods can change, but principles never do. And so I took a look into just trying to discover three very simple words to contain just some scriptural principle to help our make, make our lives, you and I, worthwhile. And and you know what I mean by worthwhile. I'm not saying your life's not worthwhile. I'm saying, what are these three things that we can really kind of hang our heart on and um, gain some wisdom? Wisdom is incredibly important. Can we agree on that? I think if there was a sign-up sheet and I said, if you would like to become wiser, sign here, and it'll happen by 2 p.m. today, everybody would sign up, right? Because we'd want that. But can I tell you, you've got the Word of God that says you can have it before 2 (laughs) p.m., Yeah, he's paid the price so you can have all the wisdom in the world. Proverbs is a book that's full of wisdom. And I encourage you to read it. My mom was here first service, and so I told the story on her how there there was a time in my life when my head was not on my shoulders. It was elsewhere, okay? Uh, Where at, we don't know. But eventually, I kind of got things right again, and I started thinking, and I got my life right with the Lord. And my mom said, Jim, can I ask you to do something? And I'll be honest, my first response was like, oh, here we go. She's going to ask me to do something, you know, whatever. She says, Jim, will you, will you read one proverb a day? And there's 31 chapters in Proverbs. There's 31 days in the month. So what I would do is, is whatever the date was, I would read that proverb. I give you the same challenge. Try it. You'll be amazed at what you learn about what wisdom is uh, and, and what it is not. And if you take this challenge and do it, I'm going to give you a heads up. You might get slightly discouraged at first. Because when I read it, it said, a wise man does this, but a fool does this. And I went, ooh, strike one, dang it. A wise man does this, a fool does this. Ah, strike two. I found I was doing all the foolish things, and it really frustrated me. I wasn't feeling very good at first. I felt kind of weighted down, you know. But then it told me what a wise man does, and so I tried doing what a wise man does. And when I tried to do that, all of a sudden, things started to change. See, the, the, the book is full of wisdom, but it does nothing for you unless you take it and apply it to your life. You've gotta, it's got to be applicable. Uh, Proverbs chapter 19, verse 20, it's in your outlines there. It says, listen to counsel and accept discipline so that you may be wise the rest of your life. Now, that same sign-up sheet I had for wisdom, uh, let me get one out for discipline. Who's going to sign up? right? Now, some of us might do it out of a sense of, well, because, you know, I don't want to look bad, so I got to, you know, whatever. But I I would just venture a guess there would be less people that would want to sign up on that. But the Bible's telling us right there, listen to counsel and accept discipline so that you may be wise the rest of your life. So it's it's saying this, it's not just about the word discipline, by the way. Um, It's not just about jumping through hoops or anything. It means this, you may, you may need, if you're going to become wiser, you may need to adjust your schedule. You may need to change the, the cadence of your life, if you will, that when you follow these principles we're going to talk about, uh, using very simple words, when you follow them, then all of a sudden you discover life is worthwhile. You keep it very simple. It reminded me of a story, I've used it before, but I like it. It was a Japanese man 
who uh, was coming from Japan, and he was coming over to the United States. And so he had a tutor that was helping him with English. And he said, listen, when I get over there and I need to order food, what do I say? So the English tutor said, hamburger, french fry, and Coke. Don't forget that. Hamburger, french fry, and Coke. He said, got it. So he came over to America. He went to the restaurant. The waitress said, what can I get for you? And he said, hamburger, french fry, and Coke. She said, sweet. And she walked off, got it, brought it to him, and he thought, this is great. But then dinner came, and he went out for dinner, and they said, what do you want? And he said, hamburger, french fry, and Coke. So he got that again. The next day, hamburger, french fry, and Coke. A month later, hamburger, french fry, and Coke. After three months, he was getting sick of hamburgers, french fries, and Coca-Cola. So he reached out to his tutor, and he said, listen, can you teach me three different words? Something, you know, I'm, I'm, I've had so many burgers and fries and and Coke. And he said, okay. He said, let's try this. Next time you go, just say this. Eggs, toast, and juice. Just say that. And he said, okay. Eggs, toast, and juice. And he committed that to memory. And the next morning he went to the restaurant and the waitress came up and said, well, hey, how are you? What what can I get you today? And he looked at the lady and said, eggs, toast, and juice. And the waitress said, well, how would you like your eggs? Over medium, over easy, poached, boiled, scrambled? And do you want white toast, wheat toast, sourdough, bagel? Um, And what kind of juice do you want? Orange, cranberry, pineapple, mango, apple? The Japanese looked at her and said, hamburger, french fry, and Coke. (laughs) It's just a lot easier if we keep it simple. And so that's what I want to try to do today. And so in your outlines, write down the first word, And that first word is learn. Life would be more worthwhile if you and I would learn. Be a lifelong learner. Don't stop learning. I've shared with you before, I couldn't wait to get out of high school because as soon as I graduate, cha-ching, I'm not going to have to ever have a test in my life. What I didn't understand is is that that the tests were just now beginning, the real test in life. You know, I think God has a sense of humor. Since I graduated high school, I've been to technical school, community college, Bible college, and and seminary. And I'm like, I I keep, now now for kicks and giggles, when I have time on my hand, I'll take free courses that are online just for the heck of it. Psychology 101. I'm like, God, you've got a sense of humor, right? Because we should always be lifelong learners, whether it's learning with education, whether it's learning in the middle of a relationship, whether it's learning in your growth in your journey with Christ, whether it's learning how to handle your finances, whatever it is, our life would be more worthwhile if we would choose to simply learn. So my question for you is, are you a person, are you known as someone who likes to learn? Are you, are you known as somebody that always wants to say, Lord, what is next for me? You see, this is the first of three simple words that could make life more meaningful. Are you willing to learn or do you Don't think that you need to learn anymore, you know? Uh, We could have arrived at some status, financial comfort, position in the company, and we're comfortable, and we know how to make this work. Or we've arrived at an age that somehow we say, well, I'm old enough that I shouldn't have to learn anything else. We should always be learning. When do we stop learning? When Jesus takes us home. When we're with him for an eternity. We should always be learning. So are you willing to be a learner? Or do you think that you don't need to learn anymore because you know enough? Um, two dangerous words that teenagers say all over the, the face of this world that can get, be a problem spiritually. I know. I know. You ever say that to your parents? Or parents ever have kids that say it to you? You need to watch out for that because and you don't even finish your sentence. I know. I know. Well, how did you know what I was going to say? I didn't even finish my sentence. But sometimes we can do that with God. And God will say, I I, I want you to learn. I want you to grow. I want you to give. I want you to serve. And we can go, I know. But he's not looking for what you know. He wants you to know. He wants you to learn. But he wants it so that it can transform something in your life. Here's what it says in Proverbs chapter uh, 19, verse 2. Zeal is not good without knowledge. And the one who acts hastily sins. Let me read to you something from Hosea. We probably heard this verse before. Chapter 4, verse 6. You can help me finish it up. My people are destroyed for what? The lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge. He says knowledge is very important. Be a learner. Don't ever stop learning. Well, we got this figured out. And, you know, we're, 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 we're comfortable right now. Uh, always be willing to learn. It, as a matter of fact, you can't truly 
completely be a disciple of Jesus Christ if you're not willing to learn. Now, I'm not saying that you're not a disciple. I'm just saying that when you look in the Scripture, disciples were learners. Actually, in the Greek, the word they used for disciple was Matthias. And I don't know if I'm exactly saying that right, but it means this. It means learner. It says, be a disciple of Christ. Be a learner of Christ. The moment you stop learning is the moment you limit your uh, uh, capability to lead anybody. Yourself, your family, your business. You must be a lifelong learner. Um, we have this old saying, what you don't know won't hurt you. You ever hear that? But I, I, I think that's actually a myth because what you don't know can hurt you if you don't know what's out there. I heard a story of two friends who went out to a sushi bar and uh, one of them, it was their first time there and while they were at the sushi bar, one of them grabbed the green sauce and smeared it all over the sushi, just piled it high took a bite, thinking it was guacamole, but it wasn't. It was wasabi. Anyone ever hear eat wasabi? That will light you up like a Christmas tree, right? You see, what he didn't know brought some great harm to him because he thought he knew. He thought he had it all figured out. And we learn from the things that in life that we see. So you and I, we've got to pay attention. We've really got to pay attention to to whatever it is, lectures, songs, sermons, conversations with people. Um, we must pay attention. We learn not only from what we see, though, we, we learn from what we hear. We learn from what we hear. So be a good listener. Uh, do you think you're a good listener? If I were to ask you today on a scale of 1 to 10, how well do you think you are at being a good listener? Don't say it out loud, but where do you rate yourself? And then take that and ask your spouse or a close family member where they would rate you. Chances are they're probably not going to match up. You see, we need to be good listeners of those that are around us. We learn from the things that we not only see and the things that we hear, but from the things that we read. What are you doing to learn, to feed yourself spiritually? The Word of God? Are you doing devotions? Are you journaling at all? Are, are you reading any good books? I always challenge people, read at least one good edifying book a year. You can do it. Anybody, you can do it. Not Dr. Seuss, okay? Talking a book that just builds you up. You can do it. Because what you're doing is, is you're learning then. And if you're like, well, I don't know any good books that are out there. Come talk to me. I got a whole list of books I can give you. And I've read books that I read, got to the end and I'm like, well, that book wasn't very good. What did I learn? I'm not reading that book again. <laughs> Next book. You know, you always learn something. But more than not, when I, when I read and when I pay attention and when I, what I see and what I hear, it builds me up and I become a learner. And I... I, I, I uh, I grow because of that. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, I was reminded of when I was doing this message is I give you the three points. I'm kind of a, a side note. If we're going to be learners, I think one of the things we have to learn is we have to learn to forget intentionally, which means on purpose. What do you mean by that, Pastor? Well, it, you know, maybe you're here today and you're saying, don't worry about it. As I get older, I, I, I forget everything. You know, that's not what I'm talking about. We are very good at forgetting the things we should remember and remembering the things we should forget. Some of us, we can't remember, I, I, I'm just making this up right now, we can't remember uh, what's a promise from God from his word. And we'd be like, um, well, he, uh, I don't know. But if I asked you about a negative situation in your life, bam, we can bring it up like that. We talk about somebody that hurt us or how we're bitter or how we're angry. And, and that just becomes kind of a cancer. You and I have to learn to forget intentionally, on purpose. Let people off the hook. Well, I don't, I don't think that's fair. If, if, if I let them off the hook, who's going to make sure that justice is served? Who's going to make sure that they pay? God says, vengeance is mine. Okay? I'll make sure that they get theirs. But just remember this. You'll get yours too if you don't obey, if you don't follow. He says, what do I do then? Learn to forget intentionally. Forgive people. Let some things go. It, we, some of us, are you here today, and if you were the Holy Spirit's uh, present, and, and if you were to ask him, is there anything in my life that I need to let go of? What would he show you? What would he tell you? What is it that you need to let go of? You've been holding on to it way too long. You need to let it go because... You holding on to it, it's only destroying you, and you have to learn to forget. Famous author Alvin Tolfer once wrote, 
that those who will be literates in the 21st century won't be people that only know how to read and write, but they will be people who can learn, unlearn, and then relearn. People that are going to be successful will be learners, but sometimes you have to unlearn some things, right? And, and then relearn it the right way. Um, we got to make sure, you see, it's not only what you take in, it's not only what you receive that's learning, but it's also what you let go of. All the hurtful experiences of the past, you need to let it go. But just hearing somebody say, let it go, that's easy said, but harder done. But all he says, but if you will trust me, if you will trust me and forgive, and I'll help you learn to forget and, and know what that means. Um, you know, because we can forget the important things, but, but we remember all the things that are maybe non-essential. There was a pastor who went to an old, older parishioner's home, let's just say about 91 years old. If you're 91 here today, that is not an insult at all. But he told her, he said, you're getting older. And I thought, you know, I just wanted to come by and have a conversation with you just about the hereafter. And she said, well, I do a lot of thinking about the hereafter. And he was shocked. You do? She said, yeah, every time I go into room, I say, what did I come in here after? <laughs> we get it when we're talking about being forgetful that way. But are we intentional to forgive and forget some of the people that have wounded us maybe in our past? Because there's certain things that we're not designed to hold on to. God did not design you and I to hold on to bitterness. Bitterness isn't going to do us any good. It's only going to destroy us. He didn't design us to hold on to anger. Now, he said you can be angry, but don't sin, right, in the Bible? But he didn't say be angry and hold on to it and let it fester until it causes you to lose sleep and steal all your joy. He, he never said that. There's some things that we have to let go. We have to learn, learn. That's the first word. We have to learn to let it go. We have to learn to forget some of those things. Uh, Jesus paved the way. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 25 says, I am he who blots out your transgressions for your sake and remembers your sin no more. Did Jesus forget? Did, he says, I, I blotted out your sins and Oh man, what did you do? Did Jesus all of a sudden get Alzheimer's or something? No, he's saying, I know what you did, but I'm choosing to forget it. I'm choosing to let that go. And as Christians being Christ-like, that's what he's calling us to do. How in the world can I do that when I've been hurt so bad? It's a learning process. It doesn't happen overnight, but you learn to, to, uh, you learn to lean into that with the Holy Spirit and he will lead you. See, Jesus said, or God said, he takes all of the sins that we've committed. He throws them into a sea of forgetfulness. As far as the east is from the west, the Bible says. And, and he remembers them no more. God intentionally forgets transgressions. Um, he can remember them if he wanted to, but he chooses not to. See, it's a choice. And you and I have to learn that. It, 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 it can be a challenge at times, but he says that I, I'm calling you to learn. Here's number two, the second word. Write down the word try. Life would be more worthwhile if we would learn, and life would be more worthwhile if we would try. If we would try. You really have, we're talking about really trying, okay? Um, not half-heartedly, but really trying to do something with what it is that God has given us. It doesn't mean that you have everything or that you need to try everything. He's not saying Try to do everything and be perfect at everything. He says, no, he says, take the giftings which I've placed in your life and try to do something with that. Produce something for the kingdom of God and watch what I will do. Because if you will learn and then you will try, then you'll be able to accomplish so much more. And he says, and do it wholeheartedly. Well, what is it that you need to increase? Maybe you're here today and you say, well, my Bible skills. I could increase my Bible skills. How about your marriage relationship? Anybody, and don't raise your hands, don't you dare raise your hands, uh, would say, I could work on my marriage skills. You know, there, there's some areas that I need to do that. Maybe it's your faith in God, or maybe it's your devotion to Christ, or, you know, you could fill in the blank with hundreds of things. The question is, what is the Holy Spirit speaking to you when he says that I want you to try? I want you to develop this gifting here. Everything that God has given you and me, we need to try to increase that. 
Do you remember, for instance, uh, in the Bible, there's a parable called the parable of the talents. And in the parable of the talents, um, he gave five um, talents to one servant. He gave two to another servant. And he gave one to another servant. And it says that they were to go out and, and try to do something with that. Here's what it says about the first guy. The one who received five talents came up and brought five more talents and said, Master, you entrusted five talents. See, I have gained five more. And his master said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I'll set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. So the guy with five talents went out and produced five more. He took the gifts that God gave him, did something with them, and brought back something more to God. The guy with two talents says, Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold or two talents. See, I have gained two more. And his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness, one translation says. Now, what I want you to catch here right now is that God is in seeing if you can outdo each other. Okay? This is not a competition. Who can do the best fundraising for Jesus? It's not about that at all. It, what he's wanting to know is, is the talents that I give you, whether it's five or two, are you doing anything with the five or the two that I gave you or not? Which brings me to the guy with the one talent. The guy with the one talent, he, he, he didn't do anything with it. He didn't even try. Uh, the Bible tells us that he said, well, he he's, he's, uh, says, I, Lord, you gave me this talent and I took it and I hid it because I know you're a harsh taskmaster. So here is your talent back that I'm giving to you. Now, do you see this is not about a competition thing about how many people can you get in the church? How much money can you have? How pretty or beautiful is your house? It's the talents that God has given you. Are you doing anything with them? Everybody here has been given talents. What they are, how many they are, and the, the, the produce of that, I, I don't know, but God does. And the question is, are you trying to do anything with that which God has given you? Or are you going to be like the guy with one talent? You're just going to bury it in the ground and sit back and say, well, you know, I'm just another day in paradise until I go see Jesus. And then we say, here's your talent back. Uh, I, have a, I, I call him a mentor in my life. His name's Wayne Cordero. And uh, um, I remember him talking about walking through a cemetery. He's probably doing a funeral or something. Either that or it was just a quiet place to walk. I don't know. But as he was walking, he said, you know, as I walked past the tombstones, he said, I look at the tombstone and wonder how much potential went in the grave with them that was never discovered. How much? And rather than wait until you're in the ground, why not ask the question now? How much potential is in this room right now for what you can do? You've got all the potential in the world to accomplish so many things. Some of you have books to write that need to be written that haven't been done yet. Some of you have songs that need to be sung or written. You know, it's a gift of talent. Some of you have acts of service that you can give that nobody else can. And, and anybody that's gifted always says, well, I can do this, but I wish I could do that. No, focus on the talent God gave you. And let it become something that when you try to lean into that, it produces something for the kingdom of God. And it's, again, it's not about competing. It's easy to sit there and say, well, pastor, it's easy for you. You're standing up there and, and you're talking and you're preaching the word and God's given you that talent and that ability. But what you don't know is that sometimes throughout the week I say, Lord, what else do you want me to do? I literally had this conversation three or four weeks ago and I said, God, I'm 52. I know I don't look like I'm 52. I think I'm round about in a 32. What do you think? What do you think? Maybe, okay, maybe not. But I told the Lord, I said, I'm 52 years old. Chances are I'm not going to live another 52. Chances. I might. Nobody knows. But here was the point. I said, Lord, if I'm not going to live another 52, how do you want me to spend these last few years? How should, what do you want me to do so I can make the greatest impact? I don't care where I need to go or what I need to do. I just want to know that I'm in the right place at the right time. For the right season. You see, only the Holy Spirit can tell you that. And he'll lead you there as to what God has for you. But you won't know that if you're not learning and you're not trying. You must learn 
and you, you must be a learner, and you must try. And in the trying process, what you're doing is increasing your capacity for the kingdom of God, uh, to give to others, to serve others, to love others. Now, again, the third man said, see, I knew you were a hard taskmaster, so I hid it. And as he handed the talent back to God, the master said, uh, you didn't even try. You should have at least put it in the bank. It could have made some interest. But no, you didn't even do that because you didn't want to get off your Nintendo or whatever the popular station is now. But what he did say, and it breaks my heart every time I read it. He told the first two, he said, uh, enter in. Well done. Well done. Good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. And then the other one, well done. Come on in. But the other one, he looked at him and he said, you wicked and lazy servant. And I thought, oh man, what harsh words. I'm not doubting that the guy maybe knew God, loved God, whatever, but he didn't do anything with what he had. He wasn't learning. He wasn't trying. And when I, when I stand before Jesus, just like you, I want to hear the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter in. I don't want him to go, you wicked and lazy servant. I don't want him to do that. None of us want that, right? So we try. We've got to do what we've got to do. I don't want to have to hear those words come from a loving God, but what he's given to you and what he's given to me, the many blessings from above, um, what's your talent? What's your talent that God has given to you? Think about that. We're not just talking like money or I have the ability to work on computers or I'm I'm great in the medical field or my gifting is in ministry or whatever it is. Uh, for all of us, what, what talent has he given you? Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's your marriage. Now, if you're having situations where you're like, you don't know my marriage. No, but he does. And wherever it's at right now, how are you doing at learning and at trying so that it can be something that uh, reproduces for the kingdom of God? Maybe it's a gift that God has placed in you, an ability. It's a, maybe it's a devotion. Maybe it's your, your finances. Maybe the talent is your children. Maybe it's your faith and your journey with Christ as you're going along. How has it, let me ask this question, how has it, whatever the talent is, how has it increased today since last year? How has it? Or maybe I need to ask, has it? Has it? We want to hear the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And so what is it that he might be telling you to do today to increase that faith? Maybe he's speaking to you about getting involved, whether it's, it could be many different areas, a Bible study to get involved in so that you can increase your faith. Maybe it's serving in, in the church. Maybe it's giving what you have, whether that's, that's time, talents, or treasure, any of those. What is it that he's speaking to you, that he's entrusted you with, that he says, take what I gave you, learn from me, and try to use what I've given you to increase the kingdom of God. So remember the, the parable of the talents. Life can be worthwhile if you learn. Life can be worthwhile if you try. So try to develop all that God has given to you as the challenge. Develop it. Increase it. You've got to try. Now the third word. He says learn. He says try. And then write down number three, the word care. Life would be worthwhile if you and I would care. Uh, the truth is, a lot of people don't really care about things that maybe we should care a little bit more about. What we happens is this. What we tend to mildly be concerned with, uh, we care a lot about, right? And, but what we really should care about, we don't give much attention to. You know, we worry and stress and give our attention to these things that are just mediocre, but these things that are huge principles, pillars in our lives that, that God is trying to establish in our lives. Sometimes we don't, we don't care to give enough attention to that. And if you care a great deal, you will receive great results, but it's all determined by the depth of your care. Remember, um, in the Bible, there was a man who was uh, uh, lame by the pool of Bethesda. It was, a, it was a pool that it would bubble up, you know, and anybody that got in the pool first was healed. And this man was sitting there, and he wanted to gain his healing, but he wasn't able to get in there. And Jesus shows up, walks by him, and he said these words to the man who was laying there. Jesus asked him, do you care enough to get well? In, in, interesting wording. Do you care? Do you even care? 
Or is this just, I want what I want, and then I'm going to do what I'm going to do? Do you care about taking, about learning, trying, and then caring enough to take what I could do in your life so that you could produce something with that? Uh, also in the Bible, there was another lame man on a stretcher. He had four friends that were helping him out. You remember that? And they took him to Jesus because they wanted, they knew Jesus could heal. And so they, they took this man to the house, but to their dismay, the whole house is surrounded by uh, by people, they couldn't get in because everybody wanted to see Jesus. So they came up with this, this great plan. Their plan was to climb up on the roof and to knock a hole through the roof big enough for the stretcher to go down. And the four men got up there. They, they knocked the hole in the roof. They lowered the guy down into the presence of Jesus. And it says that Jesus looked, yes, at the man, but it says he looked up at the four men who cared about this one man, about how they really cared. You see, your life, my life, would be very worthwhile all the more. It's simple. If you learn, if you try, and if you care, then your life will increase in what God has given you, and it will be worthwhile because you have that true sense of caring. Naaman was a man in the Old Testament. He was a very rich man. He was, he was in authority. Um, he had many people underneath him, but he had one problem that, that we learn in the Bible is he had leprosy. And it was a, a, a flesh-eating disease, right? And so this thing was eating away at him. And he said, I heard of this man of God. If I go to him, I can get healed. But before he could ever get there, word came to him and said, the man of God has spoken and said, go down and dip in the Jordan seven times and you'll receive your healing. And it says in the Bible that Naaman was mad. He was angry. As a matter of fact, right there says um, in verse 2 Kings 5, 11 and 12, Naaman went away angry. And he said, I thought, here, here's where we run into problems. I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the spot and cure my lep leprosy. And so that it ends by saying, so he went, he went off in a rage. He said, I thought God was going to do it this way. Have you ever thought that too? I have many times. God, I thought you were going to do it this way. But we have to have a spirit that is willing to learn, try, and care. Because when we think left field and God goes right, are we going to get angry and go off in a rage? Or are we going to say, Lord, whatever it is, if you were here today, and you had a disease that was life-threatening, cancer, some heart issues, I don't know, fill in the blank. And there was a man of God that showed up and said, uh, you will be healed by 2 p.m., go down to the Mississippi River and dunk yourself seven times. We'd probably go, Mississippi? Clinton Pool's right there. If it's still full, that's a little cleaner, you know. There's dead bodies in the Mississippi. There's a nastiness down there. You know, are we going to complain and go off in a rage because we think God should do it some specific way? Or are we going to be the person that's getting a speeding ticket because we have so much faith, we're hauling down there because we want to receive our healing? Those four friends that dropped the guy in the presence of Jesus, that's what it was all about, being in his presence. My question is, is how, how much do you want to be in the presence of Jesus? How much... Do you want to experience what it means to really have a simple life? It's not hard, but it does take work. You have to learn, you have to try, and you have to care. Um, let, me, let me just close with this. We'll be done. Uh, there's a story of a missionary in Africa. Uh, he, he served over there for years, but in his service, he had a Jeep. So he'd drive around to the different villages. But a lot of times his Jeep would break down. So he'd have to fix it, repair it, get the Jeep going again. It'd run for a while, it'd break down again. After about the fifth breakdown, he's getting a little frustrated, right? He's like, oh, I can't this thing just stay running? And it's so difficult over here. He started complaining. He started just getting this negative spirit about everything that was going on. One particular night, it was raining, raining hard. Like just, just the heavens opened up and it was just pouring. And while he was home complaining about his Jeep that wasn't working, all of a sudden somebody started knocking on his door. And when he opened the door, it was one of the villagers. And he said, well, what are you doing here? And the villager said, I have a gift that I wanted to give to you. And he said, well, that's pretty cool. What is it? And so he presented the gift. And this man had just recently taken up a, 
woodworking, wood carving. He said, I just started. I know it's not very good. I know it's not the best, but it's, it's my first. And I wanted to give my first fruits to you to thank you for the way that you've been serving the villages and that you brought Jesus to us. I just simply wanted to say thank you. And the missionary was so moved. I can't believe it. He said, well, how did you get here? And he said, oh, I walked. He said, you walked in this rain? He said, yeah. He said, uh, I walked in the rain. Well, the missionary was so moved. He said, you know what? L- let, let, me, let me give you, he said, which village are you from? And when he named the village, he said, that's 10 miles away. You walked 10 miles in the rain to give me this gift? And he said, yes, I did. He said, well, let me take you back. Let me, I'll give you a ride in my Jeep. To which the villager said, oh, no, 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 I can't accept that. The missionary was having none of that. He said, I, no, it's the least I can do to simply say, thank you for the gift that you've given to me. And the villager insisted, no. He said, I'm going to walk back. But it's raining outside. Yes, it is. But it's muddy outside. I, I know it is. Uh, he says, well, why won't you let me do this for you? And the villager looked back at him and said, because the walk is part of the gift. You and I need to know that the journey we're on right now, this is part of the gift. How are you stewarding the gift that God's given you? Are you a learner? Do you try? Do you care? Because until we do those foundational things, there's not much to build on. And God is calling us to a place so that when we truly become learners and we try, I didn't say succeed in all that we do. I said, try, you, you, get, you get involved and you care with the same kind of care that God has for us. Then all of a sudden mountains can be moved. So my question is, what are you going to do? What is the Lord speaking to you? If you're going to become a better learner, what does that mean for you? If you're going to try, you know, I, that encourages my heart, Pastor. I'm going to try. What does that mean? Write it down. Are you going to care? Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we're a bunch of people that don't. We care. But sometimes our care has limits, right? I care about you as long as it's not inconveniencing me. Once it starts doing that, I want to pull back. No, he's saying, can you care with the same kind of care that Jesus gives? Because when you and I do that, we'll see things change in our life in dramatic ways in Jesus' name. We bow your heads with me as we just simply say, Father, we ask today that you would cause us to be a people who have not only heard your word, but we caught your spirit. We understand now today, much more now than ever, of of these gifts that you've given, these talents that you've entrusted to us. And we ask today that you would help us to become learners, that we would take that which we learn and we would apply it to our lives so it would transform us. And Lord, when when, when we want to cultivate a caring heart, Lord, we're asking that you give us your love, your heart, your eyes, your ears, everything, so that we can care not just about with limits, but we can care with the same kind of care that you give. So we can be transformed from the inside out. So we receive that. We ask that all in Jesus' name. Amen, church. Amen.